So hello to everybody and here we are for the 10th lecture of the course and uh, in this uh, lecture we will pass from integrals to derivatives and our first uh, point uh, <coughs> to be accomplished, our first task uh, is to treat the so-called algebra of integrals so to learn uh, how integrals react when you sum them and when you multiply them by a constant factor, a very simple algebra if you want. And the second considers the part uh, of um, the computation of integrals. And so we will start to uh, try to, 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 to give, uh, uh, to associate a, numbers, a number to integrals uh, and uh, this will lead us uh, to the integral mean theorem and then to the very important fundamental theorem of integral calculus. And from there we will go to differential calculus. Okay, and then uh, we will start with it. So, the first part is, uh, of today is the algebra of integrals. So, let me start immediately with a lemma, which is quite important. Okay, we have that uh, uh, we have a function f defined on a, a finite enclosed interval a b with a strictly less than b and both a and b finite, and the f is bounded. We have that f is integrable. in a, b, and the integral of f is equal to i, if and only if, so it is an equivalence, if and only if, you know that for every epsilon larger than zero, there exists a partition of a, b, such that <coughs> e minus epsilon is less than the lower sum as fp that by definition is not larger than the upper sum capital SFB, which is less than I plus epsilon. Okay? So in order to prove that uh, an integral is equal to I, we will have to prove this bound in what follows. And uh, let us prove the lemma. So the less interesting part is the direct part, this implication here. So we assume that f is integral and that the integral f of x dx in the interval a, b is equal to i. Then let epsilon larger than zero, so we have that by definition of supremum there exists a partition P1 such that the lower sum with respect to P is larger than the supremum of, among all possible partition of, uh, sorry, this is P1, supremum uh, in P of S, F, P, minus epsilon. Of course, this is less than the supremum of the set, but if we 
uh, diminished by epsilon, then it will be larger than the supremum minus epsilon. But what is the supremum? The supremum, since the function is integrable, is exactly the integral of f. And uh, analogously, by definition of inf, there exists a p2 such that the upper sum is smaller than i plus epsilon. Now here we have two different partitions, one for the lower sums and the other for the upper sums, but of course you know that uh, there exists a common refinement of the two partitions, so let p be a common refinement, for instance the union of p1 and p2, And then by lemmas, we proved in the last lecture about the refinements, we have that i minus epsilon, that is smaller than s f p1, as we already constructed. The refinement makes the lower sum better, so better means larger for lower sum. This is s or equal s f p, which is again not larger than capital S, f p, and again since refinement make, makes better the upper sum, but here better means not larger, this is smaller than s f p2, that was, la that was smaller than i plus epsilon. So we end up with this inequality in particular, i minus epsilon, strictly less than lower sum with respect to the partition p, less or equal upper sum with respect to the same partition, less than i plus epsilon. So we proved here the first implication. Let us go to the second one, which is the most important one. And the most important one here is the following. We assume that uh, this relationship holds. Okay, so now <clears throat> since uh, for every epsilon larger than zero, there exists a partition P such that capital S FP is less than I plus Epsilon, we have what? We have that uh, for every Epsilon larger than zero, the upper integral of f of x dx, which will be less or equal s fp, less than i plus epsilon. So what happens is that for every epsilon larger than zero, the upper integral is not larger than i plus epsilon, but this is for arbitrary epsilon, even very small. So it is clear that uh, this integral here cannot be larger than i, because if it is larger, you find an epsilon that, such that i pl plus this small epsilon is still smaller than this. So as a consequence, here we have that the integral a b bar f of x dx is less or equal i. Okay? This is a quite an important point. If you don't catch the, this, please stop on that, read again, 
and uh, listen to the lecture again. The point is that this is a number. There is no P here. It is not a quantity that is varying. This is a number, and this number is small of every number which is larger than I. Every number. Also, I point zero 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 one. So, this implies that the same number cannot exceed I. Because uh, if this is... If this is uh, uh, I point zero 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 one, then you have that I point zero 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 one is larger than I and smaller than this. But this is forbidden by this rule here. Okay. And of course, analogously, You have that uh, for every epsilon larger than zero, the lower integral, which is the sup of the lower sums, will be not smaller than S F P, which will be larger than I minus epsilon, where S F P is the one that we have here in the hypothesis of the theorem. So then, oh, sorry, then. We have that here, a, b, f of x dx, the lower integral, will be not smaller than i. And this is relationship 2. So by 1 and 2, we have that i not larger than lower integral that by construction is not larger than upper integral that by 1 is not larger than i and again we have a chain of inequalities that start and end with the same element so the only possibility for this to hold is that every less or equal is in fact just an equal so as a conclusion as a consequence, we have that the lower integral must be equal to the upper integral, so f is integrable in AB. first. Second, since there is also i, which is exactly the value of the lower integral, the upper integral, we have that. The integral, the true integral, not lower or upper, of f of x dx is equal to i. This is a nice thing. So, in these uh, theorems of algebra of integrals, we will prove this in order to prove the integrability. Instead of f, we will have, for instance, f plus g. And so and this is uh, the first step that we have accomplished. And so... Let us go to the theorem. <clears throat> so the theorem is the following. Let f and g be two function from a b to r and they are integrable on a b then the sum f plus g is integrable to on a b
and the integral of the sum is equal to the sum of the integrals a b f of x dx plus a b g of x dx so the proof is as follows. So use the following notation. We denote by IF the integral of F between A and B and by IG the integral of G between A and B. Okay. So by previous lemma, there exists P1, a partition of AB, such that I minus F minus, so uh, <clears throat> as usual I forgot to say let epsilon larger than zero. So I minus F minus epsilon over 2. Why over 2? Now you know, because we are dealing with a sum, so we split the epsilon in two terms, epsilon over 2. I F minus epsilon over 2 less than lower sum, F P1, less or equal upper sum, S F P1, less than I F plus epsilon over 2. Moreover, there exists a P2 such that IG minus epsilon over 2 less than SG P2 less or equal capital S G P2 less than IG plus epsilon over 2. Okay, now we take P as a common refinement of the two partitions P1 and P2. Therefore, we start from the inequality here for f, and we use now the, the new partition f. So we have if minus epsilon over 2 less than sfp1, but p is a refinement, so less or equal sfp, which is smaller than capital SFP by rule of refinements, smaller or equal to capital S F P1, smaller than I F plus epsilon over 2. And again here, sorry, this is not really what I wanted to highlight. So I highlight this first here and then the two with P and then this guy here. So look at the green inequality and uh, there is the partition P and uh, analogously the same can be said uh, for the function G. So I immediately write the conclusion. Here we have IG minus epsilon over 2 less than S G P less than or equal to capital S G P less than IG plus epsilon over 2. So now we want to sum them uh, member by member, but 
Notice that if you, we sum them member by member, we end up with, for instance, here, lower sum of f plus lower sum of g. Sorry, here, lower sum of f plus lower sum of g. Or upper sum of f plus upper sum of g. But we want the lower and the upper sum of a, s plus g. So, to this end, let us consider... the upper sum, capital S, F plus G, P, this is equal to sum J from 1 to N on the, of the supremum of X. as an element of x, j, minus 1, x, j, and here we have f of x plus g of x times the width of the jth interval, delta x, j, okay, where we denoted the, the elements of the partition p as usual, like a equal to x naught less than x1 less than many dots less than xn equal to b. This is the partition p. Okay, now let us notice that, and this is the important passage here, the important passage is that the supremum for x in xj minus 1 xj, the jth interval of the partition, of the sum, so f of x plus g of x, cannot be larger, but sometimes it is smaller than the supremum of f of x, for x varying inside the same interval, xj minus 1 xj, plus the supremum of g of x, Again, for x in the very same interval. And uh, so, but why? Why this is so? Okay, one can prove it rigorously and so on, but I just want to to show you by a very simple example. The example is the following. Take the parabola f of x equal to 1 minus x squared, for instance. So this means that uh, you are considering this easy function here. For x equal to 0, you have 1. Okay, and the other function I want to consider is a sort of a translated parabola, why not, g of x is um, 1 minus x minus 1 to the square. It is exactly the same parabola, but this is here. Hmm. Okay, this is 1 minus x squared, sorry, this blue, okay. This is in x equal to, ah, this is, is the maximum is in, x equal to 1, and here it is the maximum. So when you sum up the 2, here the maximum is in x equal 1 half. So you have f plus g is equal to what? To minus 2x squared. That comes there is an x squared and then you have plus 2x and plus 1 
okay? It is another parabola, parabola which is uh, not so, which is here. So it is something like that. So this parabola at a vertex in one half, and so f plus g at the point one half is what? Minus two times one fourth, so it is minus one half plus one plus one, so it is two minus one half, so it is three divided by 2. And this is the maximum, so if you want the supremum of f plus g, but this is smaller than 2, that is the sum of the two supremum, sub f plus sub g. And why this is smaller? Simply why? Simply because here, the two maxima of the two functions separately do not fall at the same x. So when you sum f and g, you never sum the two maxima. When you are at the first maxima, you sum zero. When you are at the second maxima, you sum it to zero again. Okay? So you never realize the sum of the two maxima here of the two suprema because they are located at different point. Here, you just sum the two functions always at the same point. In order to reach this bound, you should sum the two maxima, but you do it here only if the two maxima fall at the same point. And this is not the case in general. Okay? And this is the only thing that you have to understand for this proof. And I gave you, I gave you this example that probably is more expressive than, than a rigorous proof. So therefore, Oh, I had a problem here. Okay, therefore, <clears throat> you have uh, the following situation. Since uh, for every subinterval here, you end up with this uh, inequality. Let us go to the upper sum. The upper sum, capital S, of f plus g related to some partition p is the sum for j from 1 to n of uh, the supremum of f of x plus g of x when x belongs to x j minus 1 x j times delta x j and this is not larger than the two sums separately because we separate here the two terms then we can use the commutative property of the sum and separate the two sums so here we have j from 1 to n of the soup f of x for x in xj minus 1 xj delta xj plus j from 1 to n of the soup x in xj minus 1 xj g of x delta xj and this is equal to what the first term is the upper sum of f and the second term is the upper sum of g. So we have that here, the upper sum of the sum is not larger than the sum of the upper sums. It's a sort of exercise for, for the tongue. <laughs> okay. And uh, in a completely analogous way, we have that the lower sum S f plus g p is not smaller than the sum of the two lower sums. So, going back to this two sums, so 
here we want to sum up these two relationships, asterisk 1, asterisk 2. So summing up member by member inequality, inequalities. So chains of inequalities asterisk 1 and asterisk 2, one finally has. So summing up the two integrals here, if minus epsilon over 2, ig minus epsilon over 2, so we have if plus ig minus epsilon, which is smaller than, sorry, here, the sum of the two lower sums. So if plus ig minus epsilon smaller than sfp plus sgp but our last reasoning here tells that this sum is less than the lower sum of the sums sorry which is uh, less or equal as f plus g p this is less or equal capital S of the same function f plus g with respect to p which is smaller or equal as we proved before here Then the sum of the two upper sums, capital S, FP, plus capital S, G, P, which is smaller, which is exactly the sum of these two terms here, here and here, which is smaller than the sum of the two integrals plus epsilon. This is IF plus ig plus epsilon. Mm -hmm. And so here we are done, because here we consider quantity here, minus epsilon, less than lower sum, less or equal than upper sum less than this guy here, and we apply our lemma that says that the uh, function is integrable if and only if, uh, and the integral is i, if and only if uh, this chain of inequality is verified with uh, here the value of the integral. So by previous lemma, we have the conclusion, we conclude the theorem, the proof, Since <clears throat> we get that f plus g is integrable and the integral of f of x plus g of x in AB is equal to IG plus IF. That is, by definition, of these symbols IG and IF, this is the integral between A and B of F plus the integral in the same interval of G. This is the end. So this theorem can seem to be extremely natural. In my opinion, it is not so natural, but perhaps I'm, I don't understand something, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm older than you, so probably my, my brain is not so fresh, but so 
the theorem is true, but uh, so let us look at the picture. If you have a very idiot function like uh, uh, piecewise constant functions, so you have uh, one piecewise constant function here, here for instance, and so on, okay? have many jumps. These are very useful, these functions. Don't, don't laugh at them. And then you add another peaceful, uh, see peaceful, it's very peaceful. It is a piecewise constant function like this. And then you go here, for instance, to zero and then something negative. Two very peaceful functions. They are piecewise constants. Then it is clear that that what you, when you sum the two functions, then the area sum. This is immediate because here, for instance, you add this part here. So this brick here, you add. At, uh, so it is just a translation of of bricks, if you want. Here you put the blue brick on that, and here again you have <coughs> something here. And uh, okay, here you add zero and here for a bit. So it is clear, so clear. But if you consider any function, it is not so clear. Uh, but the principle is the same at the end. You are still adding bricks and just translating areas one upon the other. But it is quite difficult to have a clear intuition, a clear insight of this. I don't want to make your ideas more confused on that, just to, just to stress the fact that what we prove now seems to be stupid, but it is not completely stupid, because here when you <coughs> consider the, the sum, the sum of the two, it is not clear that you are really summing the areas. The only way to understand it intuitively, in my opinion, is to reason in terms of very, very, very small bricks. And assuming that here the function is almost constant, it is quite an acrobatic idea because, of course, it is not constant. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. The, the, the intuition fails a bit because here the curvature changes a lot when you sum the two of them. Here the curvature is not there, everything is straight. So, However, it is true. The theorem is true. Okay? And now I give you the second theorem. And the second theorem is about uh, the, um, the integration of a function multiplied by a constant, okay? It is, uh, it is very easy, much easier than this. And uh, the theorem says, You have a function f from a, b to r, which is integrable. And uh, a real number c, then cf is integrable. And uh, the integral of uh, the function cf equals c times the integral between a and b of f in the x. So the same constant goes outside the integral, okay? And the uh, proof is quite easy. First, we consider the case of a positive C. And by the previous lemma, we know that for if we take let epsilon larger than zero, there exists a partition P such that I minus epsilon over C, and here it is important that C is positive, is less than SFP not larger than capital S FP less than I plus epsilon over C where we used 
the notation i equal to the integral of f. Now, okay, this is quite intuitive that the supremum, since c is positive of cf for x in xj minus 1 xj, is equal to c times the supremum of f in the same interval. Then you have that capital S cf p is equal to C, capital S, F, P. And then multiplying this by C, multiplying the chain of, ine of inequality asterisk by C, we have C, I minus epsilon Le less than C, S, F, P, not larger than C, capital S, F, P, less than C, I, plus epsilon. So again, by the second lemma, then, C, F is integrable. On A, B. And the integral of CF of X equals C times the previous integral, the integral in AB of F of X dx. So, the second case is c less than zero. And here you have to pay attention to this fact, that there is an exchange between the supremum and the infimum. So, between the upper sum and the lower sums. Try to write down the, uh, the proof. It is not difficult. You don't have to reason too much. You have to be careful. Okay? So, it is a matter of care in doing things. So is equal to zero, and this is quite stupid, but again, if you write down it by care, you, you learn something. You learn how to behave properly as mathematicians. So, very easy corollary, I just tell you, because uh, it will be important in the course of geometry. So, the integral is what you will call the linear map or a linear operator map or operator on the set of functions what does this mean it means that if you have to integrate a function which is lambda f plus mi g where lambda and mi are two real numbers, then this is equal to lambda times the integral of f plus mi times the integral of g. This strange structure here, you have lambda one element and g the other and mi the others, so there is uh, an element of your set, set of function, which is multiplied by a number plus an element of the same set multiplied by another lambda, this is called linear combination of function f and g. And the course of geometry is the study of the structure generated by linear combination. So this is just uh, an idea. And, okay? And uh, so the third theorem of the algebra is a quite a different theorem here. I give you in this part, in this video, because it is again on the algebra. So the theorem is the following. The hypothesis is minus infinity. It's less than A. 
less than b, but here there is another point, an intermediate point, c, less than plus infinity. And you suppose that f is integrable in both intervals AC and CB. Then F is integrable in AB and the integral of F of X dx in AB is equal to the integral in AC, f of x dx, plus CB, f of x dx. What does it mean? It means uh, something that is geometrically extremely natural. So here you have A, B, and uh, so here you have uh, your function here. But there is another point C. Theorem says that the sum, so the area with sign below the, the curve is exactly the area with sign split in two. First, a term with, which is between A and C. Here you have the integral between A and C. And second, the area between C and B. Okay. This I don't want to prove. I leave you the proof as an exercise. I tell you the idea. The idea, given a partition P, refine it by adding the point C. So you use P prime is equal P union C. And so you and then you can split the upper sum of, uh, of, uh, of the function on the whole interval AB in the two upper sums up to C and then and then uh, before C. Okay, it's an easy exercise. And then uh, I give you other exercises, if you have f from AB to R integrable, then also the absolute value of f from AB to R is integrable. And you have that uh, the integral of f is less or equal the integral of absolute value of x. Okay? And more generally, it is true, and you want to try to prove it, if f and g from a, b to r are both integrable, but f of x not larger than g of x for every x in a, b, then also the integral of f of x is not larger than the integral of g of x. Hmm? And at the end, the exercise. Is it true also the opposite of the, of the exercise here? So here we say that if f is integrable, then absolute value of f is integral. Is it true the opposite? if 
the absolute value is integrable, then also the function is integrable. Think of it and go for the next video where we try to compute through integrals.